So chapter seven of the syllabus covers uh, quantitative methods. You can expect uh, anywhere between 10 and 20 questions there. But of course, quantitative methods also extends into other areas as well. For example, in equity analysis, fixed income, uh, etc. So uh, as well to understand really the basic principles um, that apply to all before moving on. The first section we're going to look at are the sources uh, of data. So, first of all, we're looking at some statistical uh, definitions here. So when we talk about descriptive statistics, this is where we've basically got a summary of the data. So measures like the mean or the variance um, of a particular thing. A variance, of course, as we saw earlier on, particularly the measure of standard deviation, is, is basically a unit of risk that we're trying to understand how far the uh, actual outcome in a particular series, like for example the returns on a stock, could deviate from the mean. So when we talk about our variance, of course, we're talking about, for example, the variance of the mean or the standard deviation of the mean. So inferential statistics are basically forecasts that are being made. Now, of course, this is very important in financial analysis uh, in terms of what we're generally trying to do is to forecast gross domestic product or trying to forecast a share price in the future. But we're inferring the statistic from some other set of data that we have. Also, we distinguish between primary data and secondary data, so primary data is that which we gather directly and secondary data is really um, derived from that primary data. And then also um, we look at time series data, so again particularly importantly here we might look at the value of a share price through time. Compared to that we might look at cross-sectional data, so we might look there for example at different sectors, industrial sectors, and look at the behaviour of equity markets in those different sectors. So we also distinguish between a population where we've got all of the members of a particular specified group or where we're just taking a sample. So in fact there are different statistical approaches that we adopt depending on whether we actually have a population, whether we have all of the observations uh, or whether we're just dealing with a sample. Now, in the ambit of sampling, there are different ways to do this. So a very simple way of doing this is just, just to take a random sample. So we just, out of the overall population, we pick uh, at random various members, all of which should have an equal chance of being selected. Otherwise, it would not, uh, of course, be random otherwise. Now, we may get some bias in our sampling there because we might just happen to pick all of the shares. If we're picking shares out of the Russell 2000 index, we might in fact pick 150 shares that are in the financial services sector. So a non-random sample, a valid way of taking that would be what's called a stratified random sample where we divide the population into different strata or cl classifications and then take a random sample from each of those um, strata. So first of all we take a different strata here either by the size of the company, the market cap or the sector and then take samples within there. So that we ensure that we get a more even spread across different industry sectors um, for example. In terms of data distribution, there's really two principal types here. So what we're trying to describe with the data distribution model is really describing all of the possible values that a variable can take. So the two different types here, firstly a discrete variable. So this is where a variable can take on a countable number of outcomes. So for example, um, you could count the number of rainy days in August. It would be a discrete number, 15 or 12. A continuous variable can take any value. So this would actually be the amount in millimetres, for example, of rainfall that you get in August. So it's not going to be a discrete number of days, 
um, from 1 through to 31, it actually could take any value um, of uh, millimetres of rainwater through that time. Also, we distinguish between categorical and ordinal data. So categorical data is simply where we're putting our data into a set of uh, categories. Uh, so in the ambit of financial markets, we look into industry sectors, uh, the level of credit rating, uh, etc. But we're not particularly putting it in any order. So we, we might put our industry sectors in, for example, alphabetical order. So it's not actually important uh, what order they go in. Whereas with order, ordinal data, it is crucially important what order we go in. So, for example, if we looked at uh, our credit rating uh, series here, it matters in this case what um, credit rating order we put in, all the way from the best credit risks of AAA all the way down to bonds that have already defaulted. Looking at frequency distributions, what we're trying to do see here is to see how often a particular uh, outcome is recorded. So let's say we've, we're looking at the number of stores here that we have um, that are producing a given level of sales volume. So we're basically here just trying to find where we've got the highest number of stores producing a given level of sales in any particular week. So again, no particular order here. We're just uh, saying that we've got the most uh, categories here. But then we can use what's called a cumulative frequency distribution, where we actually essentially add up here. So we start off, of course, with five. Then we add on another two there. And then we'll come down and we'll add on four. And then finally, of course, we add on the final three so that we end up with 100% of the possible outcomes by the time we get to there. So this is helpful when we're saying, well, how, how many stores below a given level of sales, for example. So it gives us a nice uh, way of analyzing the data. Different ways of displaying the data, bar charts versus uh, histograms. So generally the difference is with a bar chart is that it doesn't really, the, the area that we have here doesn't really mean anything. Whereas with a histogram, then actually if we take the overall area that we have here in terms of the height of individuals, then actually the area represents the total height uh, of the individuals falling into each class. So a histogram, importantly, show, is showing continuous uh, data there. So that's quite an important uh, differential. So there's much more information, in fact, in histograms than there are in bar charts. Now, one of the most common uh, probability functions or distribution functions that we find in financial um, analysis is this very familiar normal uh, distribution. And as before, we're looking underneath the normal distribution here, and that's describing 100% of the outcome. So all of the things that can possibly happen, for example, in terms of investing in a company, we could go all the way from a very bad outcome at the, at the one end here to a very good outcome. Uh, at the other end, depending on what's happening from being declared bankrupt to being bought out by a much larger company. So in fact, we call the extreme outcomes the tails of the distribution. And in fact, you hear in financial markets a lot of talk of this tail risk if, for example, our company goes bust for whatever reason. So we look there at a probability density function, and we can similarly have a cumulative distribution function, as we saw before, but based on that type of thing. So again, we're increasing our cumulative density function until we've got all of the possible outcomes up to 100% or up to 1 uh, as a proportion, as a fraction um, included within that. But the use of it is to say, how many have we got? in terms of people who scored 
less than 15, and that would be contained in the area uh, here. Other ways of displaying data are scatter plots. So a scatter plot basically is looking at one variable relative to another. So what we're generally using this for is to see if there's any correlation between two variables. Is there any relationship between gross domestic products, the level of activity in an economy, and inflation? So we could perhaps draw a, a line of best fit through the distribution there and see whether we felt there was a strong relationship. Pie charts used for categorical data, where we just, out of the overall 360 degrees uh, that we have here, um, that corresponds to 100% of outcomes. So again, we've got a family pets example here, looking at the um, overall population of uh, family pets here, divided down into a pie chart. Very commonly, when we're looking at uh, economic variables and indeed when we're looking at returns on securities, we often use a logarithmic scale. So what this enables us to do is to look at the growth of a particular variable much more clearly than we could by just plotting the uh, numbers. So we've got here, for example, um, Chinese gross domestic product. So we can see that, in fact, we've got a curved relationship here. That's actually an exponential function, a non-linear function, in other words. So we can see that the Chinese economy, as we know, has grown extremely fast uh, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. But by drawing the logarithmic scale, we can actually plot the rate of growth um, that we're observing. So we can see that actually, as well as growing, it's actually been growing at a constant rate of growth through time. So a logarithmic lot, lot scale enables us to see that growth much more clearly. Now, what is the logarithm? Well, very simply, it's what we raise one given number to um, to get another number, i.e., what is it to the power of? So, for example, we could say that 10 raised to the power of 3 is 1,000. In other words, we multiply 10 by itself three times in order to get up to 1,000. So we can express 1,000 as 10 raised to the power of 3. Or another way of expressing it, perhaps slightly more elegantly, is to say that the logarithm of 1,000 to base 10 is 3, or log base 10 to 1,000 equals 3. So we're answering the question, to what power do I have to raise 10 to get 1,000? So it's really a shorthand way of expressing large numbers, really. But using a common base, so we might use the base 10 here, for example, or as we saw earlier on in the key concepts, we might actually use um, a base E. So we actually can call our log logarithm the power of number, in our previous example, 3. That's also called an exponent. So exponents are basically describing growth and are very widely used throughout economics and finance. So importantly, where we've got constant growth uh, functions, we have something called the natural logarithm. So this is the number e, which we saw in the key concepts, of course. Um, and we take that number e, which is equivalent to about 2.718%, and then raise it to the power of a rate of interest multiplied by the number of years it is that we have an investment. So this actually enables us to continuously compound a particular variable, as if it's growing constantly all the time, which of course um, factors like GDP growth would be. So uh, the Chinese economy, of course, is growing all the time. So we can 